It's a great honor to be here. I, uh, in some respects, feel that this is a continuation of a journey uh, that started many years ago, probably with a spiritual encounter with an art teacher named Mr. Ross, who taught in her high school in the inner city of Pittsburgh. And I was walking down the corridor of our school, and the art room happened to be open, and he made a ceramic bowl. It was one of those life experiences where my guard was down and the image went right through. And Mr. Ross turned around and he said, can I help you? I said, what is that called? He said, oh, that's called ceramics. I said, well, I want you to teach me how to do that. So for the remaining two years of high school, I learned ceramics as an apprentice to Mr. Ross, who then told me that he was leaving this school to take a job at a college and he was not prepared to have me die on the streets in my neighborhood like other members of my school. So Mr. Ross insisted I fill out a college application, which I did to the University of Pittsburgh where I enrolled as a student on academic probation because my academics were very poor. Well, I graduated from that university with honors and now I was the commencement speaker for that university in front of 13,000 people. And I said, don't give up on the poor kids. They might end up being the commencement speaker someday. I believe that people are born into the world as assets, not liabilities. It's all in the way that you treat people that drives behavior. If Mr. Ross had not recognized that in spite of my academics, I had a gift for extraordinary achievement, I would have become another casualty of the inner city. So for whatever reason, a higher power, luck, coincidence, I have been launched on this mission to try and make a contribution to improving the condition of the world as I have come to know it. My big contribution, I hope, today will be to reinforce the concept that space, physical space, can actually alter behavior. That may be the great insight that I have developed. And I have Japan, in many ways, to thank for this because Mr. Ross, my art teacher, took me to see a very famous house called Falling Water, which was built by an American architect named Frank Lloyd Wright, who was deeply, deeply affected by the architecture and design style of Japan. And I happened to see this house that Mr. Wright built just outside of Pittsburgh, and it transformed the way that I saw space and architecture as human possibility. So I committed myself to building a Frank Lloyd Wright Center before I left the earth, and I did. I'm gonna show you a picture of it. I hired one of Mr. Wright's students to build this center in the worst neighborhood in Pittsburgh with the highest crime rate, which happens to be my neighborhood. My whole 63 years has been in six city blocks in Pittsburgh. I was born in that neighborhood, I work in that neighborhood, and I will die in that neighborhood. The point of which is to let the young people know that you can bring the world to your neighborhood. You don't have to go anywhere. I believe that location and neighborhood and friendships and nurturing. Better? These qualities are what define community. So I've committed myself to building a center in Pittsburgh, or continue to build one, and as you'll see, to build them all over the world. So let me show you a picture of the center that we built. This is the center that we built. 
It's in the highest crime rate neighborhood in Pittsburgh. This is my vision of how to build schools for poor people. This is how people should be treated. The building is flooded with sunlight. It has water. And what we've learned is that water and sunlight and flowers and food cures cancer of the spirit. That's what I discovered. That's why I won the MacArthur, because I figured out the cure for spiritual cancer. Flowers and sunlight and food and hope cures cancer. I did win the MacArthur Fellowship, and I, in my class was a man named Stephen Hawking, who we believe was the greatest physicist since Albert Einstein. He and I received the MacArthur at the same time. The young man from the inner city with poor academics and the greatest physicist in Albert Einstein receiving the same award. Don't judge the book by the cover. You never know in what form your next MacArthur Fellow or Goy Peace Awardee is going to show up. This is the entrance to the building. Pittsburgh is gray from November to May, but even on a gray day, the building is flooded with sunlight. Why? Because it's very difficult to teach people when they're in the dark in their spirit. So the theory of the building was to put people into the sunlight and let them know that the sun is for everybody on the planet, not just rich people. And so the sun illuminates this building even on a gray day, which means by definition it's hopeful. One of the worst aspects of being poor is what it does to your spirit. Poor people never have a nice day. Most of the time they don't even recognize that the sun is coming up in the morning because they stop looking at the sun. So I decided to reinstitute the idea of light being part of the strategy to bring people from the dark into the light. We have beautiful artwork everywhere your eye turns in this building is something beautiful looking back at it. That's quite deliberate. We have many of the cultures of the world represented in this school, and there's no anti-theft system on the artwork. And we haven't lost a quilt or a pot in 27 years in the highest crime rate neighborhood in Pittsburgh. There's no metal detector in my building. There is no cameras in my building. Not one incident in 27 years. That's not luck. That's called a strategy for life. We have more artwork. That's our boardroom. I commissioned a Japanese cabinet maker <laughs> named Tadao Irimoto, who grew up in Kyoto. 25 years ago when I met him, a friend of mine came to Kyoto, married this fellow in Brimeback, Pittsburgh, and we were a building trades program, and he turned out to be a woodworker, but he had studied with a very famous Japanese-American named George Nakashima, and I was aware of Nakashima, so I hired Mr. Erimoto to do furniture for our building. That's our boardroom table, and we have his furniture throughout the building. Why? because I believe that poor people are entitled to the work of George Nakashima. That's why. Because the work that he is doing cures cancer of the spirit. So when my students come to school, this is what they see when they walk in the front door of the building every day. Because I believe that art has a lot to do with redemption. I think the two are directly connected with each other. And they are now represented in my building every day. Now we've since set up Mr. Aramoto in his own building, in his own business. He has a year waiting list doing furniture for high net worth individuals in Pittsburgh. But we got 60 pieces out of it for our school because the students deserve it. We will have fresh flowers in our building every day. Not every other day. Every day. Flowers, furniture, light, food, cures cancer. That's why.
we um, built a million dollar kitchen with the courtesy of the Heinz Ketchup Company that happens to be headquartered in Pittsburgh. I noticed in the hotel where I'm staying, you have Heinz Ketchup, that's very good. I was glad to see that. I will celebrate that hotel in Pittsburgh with the Heinz Company when I get back. Um, Senator Hines, who was our United States Senator, believed in me, gave me a million dollars, and we built one of the most important kitchens in Pennsylvania to train poor people to do gourmet food every day. 100% of our graduating class, two classes ago, went to work in the industry for which they were trained. We now know that we can train gourmet cooks in about 10 months, going to work at private clubs and country clubs and institutional cooking. These are poor people who had no experience with food prior to enrollment in our center, and they've become extraordinary cooks in less than one year's time. We built an amphitheater for the students. This is one of our students. We took the design from a Ritz-Carlton hotel and built it. This is the work that the students are doing after six months in the middle of a high crime rate neighborhood in Pittsburgh. This is lunch at our school. We have decided that if you want to teach people, you can't teach them if they're hungry. So the answer is to give them something to eat, but we don't do fast food, we do gourmet food. So every student in our building has a gourmet lunch every day, good for their stomachs, better for their spirits. This is being done by poor people who supposedly have no imagination and no ability. Well, if that's possible, why are we living like this is the question. Because if poor people are able to do this in Pittsburgh, I believe poor people can do this anywhere in the world any country, any city, any time. In fact, I believe it so much, I'm betting my life that I'm right. This is the dining room for our students. This is our pharmaceutical program. We're training poor people to do pharmaceutical applications in six months with no background in science. We now know that there's a direct correlation between self-esteem and technology. You build environments for people that allow them to feel like human beings, they now can learn technology. So we've now made that connection, which is very important. And our students go to work for the leading pharmaceutical companies in Pennsylvania um, every day of the week. This is our dining room. This is where our students eat. This is our concept of a dining room for poor people because we now know that spirit determines performance. Good food, beautiful environment creates creativity, imagination, and results. We also train chemical technicians for the chemical industry. You come to visit me and every one of you is invited, and I mean it. You'll see poor people doing chemical applications using logarithmic calculators within 12 months of enrollment in our center with no background in science. No one on the planet is that lucky. Environment drives behavior. We train pharmaceutical technicians, as I mentioned. Let's go the other way. One of our students. This is our library, more of our handcrafted furniture. We have people for the first time in their life as adults reading books. It's very difficult to teach people to be a part of life if they can't read. So we solve that problem. This is the arts program, Bill Strickland, 
uh, ceramic artist. I created this based on the old English craft guilds, master, apprentice. I recruited 300 students from the Pittsburgh Public School. These were all kids who were flunking out of school. We graduated 95% of the kids last year. We've discovered that there's nothing wrong with the kids, that affection and sunlight and good food and music can't cure. We do ceramics. Oh, I was very influenced by Amada's work. Mr. Ross used to bring me the work of Amada when I was 16 years old and I said, I wanna make pots like Amada someday. I don't think I achieved that, but I certainly achieved a great deal of affection and love for his work. This is all student work. These are all the children who supposedly have no artistic ability. What we've discovered is the kids have plenty of artistic ability, but you must build the environment to give them the chance to show you what they're capable of. This is a mosaic project we did with the kids. This is the piece they did. This is all ceramic. And they did this piece for the school. This is all going on in an inner city neighborhood with a high crime rate, but not in my building. Not one incident in 26 years. No violence, no drugs, no alcohol, no police calls, and we have no anti-theft system in anything that we do. We do photography. The kid who took this picture is now working for Walt Disney Studios. This is the gallery. This is the student show for the kids. This is how we believe that the children of poor people need to be presented. We now have all of their parents coming to celebrate their kids. 25 years ago, we had the shows and none of the parents would show up to support their children. So we started to recruit the parents like we recruit the kids. The last show, 200 parents showed up and we didn't pick up one parent because now it's socially not acceptable not to show up and support your children at the Manchester Craftsman's Guild, so we solved that problem. We built this. This is called a digital imaging center. We now are sending kids to Rhode Island School of Design and Pratt and Savannah Art Institute, the premier design schools in America, from this classroom. All children who had no ability to learn, supposedly, and no enthusiasm in living. Well, they're doing fine. I also built a music hall, and a very famous jazz musician named Dizzy Gillespie showed up, and he fell in love with my center, and he said, you're a tremendous jazz musician. I said, I don't play jazz. He said, oh, yes, you do. This center is your song. Anyone that could figure out how sunlight and food and clay and furniture have something to do with curing cancer is a jazz musician. So we now record all of our concerts and we've won six Grammy Awards for our recordings in the middle of a tough inner city neighborhood in Pittsburgh. So there's no one on this planet that can tell me the extraordinary things that you can do in inner city neighborhoods. You can do it every day of the week. This is the place on opening night. My parents, who are now deceased, lived long enough to see their child open up this center, and we had, it was formal black tie. The next night, we had the neighborhood come in. They had the same food both nights. I wanted to establish the principle that you don't have to own a formal dress and eat in order to be treated like somebody wearing one. And I knew that people would start talking about that, so we now sell out every concert in subscription three weeks after the season's announced in the inner city of Pittsburgh. There's Dizzy Gillespie, Billy Taylor. Oh, we also had uh, a fellow named Sadao Watanabe came and played, and we loved him very much, and he loved us. Pat Matheny, this is our recording studio. Paul Simon, the artist, 
His engineers designed this acoustically perfect recording studio for free. And Nancy Wilson, the great jazz singer, won back-to-back -back Grammy Awards with us. These are all children from the public school system and they're brought over for jazz. They love the music. And because they love the music, we can teach them. And because we can teach them, they will become successful. This was where my building was located. This is what the neighborhood looks like where the building I just showed you. So we had another box built. We built that building. We built a medical technology center in the middle of desolation in Pittsburgh. Not one incident since the building has been open. There's the fountain. University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. We have a bank in there. Oh, and also grow orchids. Another contribution from Japan. I just discovered that orchids are part of the cure for cancer. So I built a 40,000 square foot greenhouse. We train poor people to grow orchids. We sell the orchids in the grocery stores. We generate money to support the school. So there's no tuition at this center I've been describing to you. It's all for free. And what the students give back is they become productive citizens. They're out of poverty and so are their children and we break the cycle. These are the flowers that we're growing and those flowers. We won awards for our orchids from the Orchid Society. So now the Orchid Society meets at our facility because it's good for everyone to know that we're basically built about the same. Now I'm down to the end of the presentation and this is where the story takes on another interesting turn. When I did my slide presentation at a place called the Silicon Valley in the United States, a young man came out of the audience and he said, what a terrific story. I'm very honored to meet you. I asked him, what do you do for a living? He said, oh, I built a company called eBay. I said, oh, well, that's great. I didn't know what eBay was. So I took the man's card and I went back to Pittsburgh and I asked one of our technology kids, I said, what is eBay? He said, oh, that's the great technology company. I said, oh my, I met the guy that built the company, so I called him up. I said, Mr. Skull, I've come to have a much deeper appreciation of who you are. And he said, I think you'll, you would figure it out sooner or later. You're onto a big idea. Here's $500,000. I said, what's that for? He says, your first replication. Against all probability, Jeff Skull and I have become very close friends. He's on my national board. And I asked him one night why he was spending time with me. He said, because I think you're eBay on the social side. I think you can build these centers all over the world. I think Dizzy Gillespie was right. And so Jeff and I have become close friends. We're, just, we're gonna build centers all over the planet. We're starting with the United States. We have four centers open and operating as we speak. This is the one in San Francisco before it was improved. There's Mr. Jeff Skull, eBay, and Billy Wong, and the kids doing digital imaging. These are the kids' work. Now these are all the children everybody's given up on, who are violent, supposedly can't learn anything. Well, they're learning fine. This is the center we opened in Cincinnati. This is the work they're doing. We graduated 96% of the kids from this program in Cincinnati. They turned this into a business, $10,000 a mural, doing murals all over Cincinnati. This is the one we opened up in Grand Rapids. Cut the dropout rate from the school system to 5% in 36 months. The point of the story is there's nothing wrong with the children. The school system's the problem, the kids are fine. They need light, they need food, they need hope, and you can cure cancer. These are photographs of Dr. Martin Luther King taken during the last two years of his life. This is the dining facility for the students. You get the pattern? Every center is beautiful without apology. This is all student work. All the people with no talent. And these are some of our graduates. Um, one of the things we've noticed is the students, as they get more 
engage with the program, their self-esteem goes dramatically up and they go off to college at the rate of about 95%. I have three PhDs who came through my art program, an orthopedic surgeon and a kid at the Harvard Business School who I met when I lectured at Harvard. These used to be called poor people. They're now called pharmaceutical technicians. This is the one we just opened in Cleveland. When the kids got there for the first time, they walked away from the building because they thought that they had got off at the wrong stop. This building could not possibly be for them. Part of my goal is to change the image in their minds to what we're showing you right now. These are the kids. They're doing recording technology, medical technology, medical technology laboratory, and this is the one we're going to build in New Haven. We have already raised the money. We'll be opening the center up in May 2012. This is the one we're building in Boston. We expect that this center will be done in two years. We've already committed half the money. And now we're working on these cities, Austin, Boston, Brockway, six more, and three countries, Halifax, Vancouver, Northern Israel. When I was in Israel, we had the Jews on one side, the Arabs on the other, and I was showing my slides. And one man who was a Muslim at the end of the presentation reached out and put these beads on the table. And I asked the interpreter, I said, what are these beads? He says, well, every Muslim is required to go on the Hajj to Mecca during their lifetime for which they get a set of beads. He's giving you his beads. He says, you're a true believer. That was an interesting moment. So we now have two acres of land in northern Israel to build a center for the kids. If we can build a center in Israel for Jews and Muslims to go to school together, it ought to be possible to build one in every city on the planet, yesterday preferably. And we have a piece of legislation. We believe that the United States Congress is going to fund a bill to start building these centers all over the United States. We have Republicans and Democrats agreeing on building a bill. Why? Because the problem has nothing to do with Republicans or Democrats. It has to do with human beings, as you at the Goy Foundation know as well or better than me. And then finally, I have a book out called Make the Impossible Possible. It tells this whole story. It is now in Japanese. It's doing quite well, and it's a source of great hope for everyone who reads the book. And now let me conclude my comments with a few things I think you should know. One of which is that the prize that Mr. and Mrs. Sonji have created is a demonstration of the power of the human spirit. Number two, I believe that we can change the destiny of our planet in the lifetime of most of our kids. This is solvable. There are answers to these problems. I've shown you some today. There are many, many more. Three, we're going to visit some of the people at the tsunami site. And I've already concluded two nights ago at a party that if I don't do anything else but help build a center there, then I've done my job in terms of this award. And perhaps most importantly, I believe that when we start out in life, we all start out in the same place as potential. It's what happens in the environment that drives the outcome. If a young man was able to have his life saved by an art teacher in an inner city neighborhood in Pittsburgh to go on to become the GOI Peace Awardee with the likes of Bill Gates and Bill Drayton, it must give you hope 
that we could change this world for the better. And we could do it right now. I hope that you feel that I'm in a big hurry. We're losing our planet and we're losing our children. This has got to stop. This is not about Japan or the United States or Brazil. It's about the human race. I intend to make one small contribution, as many of you undoubtedly have and will. And finally, I'd like to address some of the people who remind me of students I met yesterday who have a deep spirit and we connected with each other. And I said to them, as I will say to you, particularly the young people, for those of you who are so gifted with the power of the human spirit, I fully appreciate how discouraging your journey can be because the world is not caught up to where you already are. And from time to time, I'm sure you get despondent and you lose your hope, as I do, even in spite of the fact that I've learned many things along the way. I met the Dalai Lama and I was in a very bad emotional place that day and thought that my life had been thrown away working with poor people. And the Dalai Lama looked at me at a, in a way I will take to my grave. And without words, he communicated to me that I was not alone in my journey. He was with me in my journey. I am with you in your journey. And the Goy Peace Award has given me the encouragement and the strength to continue on this journey till the day I die. Thank you for providing me with one of the most extraordinary memories in my life. Thank you very much.